matter to God and they matter to us. Because God spoke to me. He said, I want those signs to be a one-line sent sermon or one-sentence sermon. And I thought, you know, that may be the only sermon we get to preach to somebody. But, but God's love is what we're going to be talking about in a minute. But let's look at a couple verses. It says in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, Now the Spirit expressly says, In the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And last week, we, we've been talking a few weeks about this. Last week we talked about having a, what I call a winning mindset or thinking like a winner. Because Paul says to Timothy in verse 11 and 12, he says, these things command and teach. And he says in the next verse, verse 12, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And we, and, and we opened up these six areas or six practices that feed our attitude and help, help us show people how to win in life. Last week, I talked about our words. The importance of our words. What you say matters. Amen? Whew. I tell you, if you don't believe that words aren't powerful, all you got to do to find out how powerful they are is one of you guys turn to your wife and say, Honey, you know, now that I look at it, I think that outfit makes you look fat. That's some dangerous words. Amen. Words are powerful. But then we talked about our conduct, the things we do, and how what we do matters, how we live matters. And today, he says, I want you to be an example to believers in word, in conduct, and then he says, in love. He's talking to us about letting our love work and show to other people. There's a verse, I, I don't think I have it on the screen, I didn't get it to David in time, but trust me, it's in the Bible. It's Mark. When it, you know, remember when they came to Jesus and they said to him, what's the greatest commandment? I preached some of that since I've been here. But he says to them, thou shalt love the Lord your God. Then he says, you shall love your neighbor. The key was you will love. And, they, and, and Paul is admonishing Timothy and saying, be an example and let people see that you love, that you love people. And I think they need to see how the things we choose to love. Because a lot of times, uh, we get to loving the wrong things. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But he, and, and he even wants to, to us to show people the extent, how much we can love. I remember, I, I heard it, in, it was a big hit in the 70s by the Bee Gees. How deep is your love? How deep, how deep is your love? And, and that's, of course, that's a romantic song. But God, you know, we're to show people how much. In fact, I want to show you a verse. And, and it's in the, from the message translation, 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, I, I think that will be up there. You can look at it. But I want to I read this verse to you. But I, I'm going to first read it from the King James, a few verses, and then I want to show you and talk about what's on the screen. In verse number, uh, chapter number 4, he says, uh, let me look at this. Oh, verse 7. We'll start there. But the end of all things is at hand. Remember Paul says, last days. Here Peter's writing it now. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Now look how it's written in the message. Most of all, verse 8. Most of all, love each other. Everybody say that. Love each other. He says most of all. Of all the things that Peter could have stressed... He said, most of all, love each other. And then he says in that version, how do you love each other? As if your life depended on it. That's powerful to think. He says, love each other like your life depended on it. Why? Because love makes up for practically anything. There's nothing like a, a mother or a parent's love for their children. It just makes up for things. I remember when I first got in this family, I knew the Smiths all loved each other, but uh, David was riding in my car, and he was singing. And I'll tell you something, David's a good singer now. God did a miracle on that boy. But back then, bless his heart, he couldn't get on key if he tried. But, but, but he loved his singing. That's because he, he, you was listening through the ears of love. 
I was listening through the ears of pitch. And, and, and according to the pitch, he was off. And he was singing his song, Praise the Lord. And he just sang it as loud as he could. And I'm saying, I want to throw you out of my car if you don't quit singing. Because I loved him a little bit, but I didn't love him like Buddy loves him and Winoka loves him. And anybody that's ever had children, we know that the greatest challenge, I think, of love in a parent, all of it, when you have kids, you love them because it's so cute. Then they go to your house and they do things that aren't cute. And uh, I think the greatest challenge of parent, parental love is that se season when you go through called potty training. Some children are robots, and it's just like kapow, abracadabra, it's done. Then there's other kids that you say, I think they want to torture me for about two years. Go all day in a pull-up and nothing happens. You say, I think we won this battle. Put on training pants and all of a sudden, uh-oh, had an accident. You had all day to have an accident. But you have it at the wrong time. That's how love is. Love just puts up with things. Because when you love people, mama's love. Man, my wife, we, we, we've actually lived our life as good cop, bad cop, and for the last uh, 30 years, I've had to be the bad cop because she's always the good cop. She's always the one that shows the love. But love, he says, love makes up for practically anything. And you say, now why is, it so, why is that so important? Because as Christians, our calling card is love. See, uh, our love is what points people to Christ. He says, how will men know that you're my disciples? That you have love one for another. And, and see, the thing, though, we have to worry about, and I'm going to just touch on this for just a moment, is how that we've got to watch out for the love robbers in our life. There are things in our life that will rob us of our love, or they will rob us of our love for God. Over in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says this. And listen to what, what uh, John writes. He says, do not love the world. Pretty simple, isn't it? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's some strong verse. Love not the world. Don't love the world. And then he describes what he's talking about. For all that is in the world. Now what is the world made up of? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. The world is made up of three components that try to rob us of our love for God. The first is the lust of the flesh. Now that word lust, you say, no, no, what, what does that mean exactly? Let me explain what lust really is. It is pressure from within or without. It is a pressure. And he says, the lust or the pressure of the flesh. Let me tell you what the flesh says. When you, when you are driven by the pressure of the flesh, it says to us, do what you wanted. I must do it, even if it's wrong. I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. Because that's what the lust of the flesh does. It pressures us to do things. And we don't care if it's wrong. We'll do it anyway. The lust of the uh, eye says, i got to have that no matter what it takes. I can't afford it. It's not mine to have, but i got to have it. That's the pressure of the eye. The pride of life is that part of us that says, I got it and you don't. I, got, I can do this and you can't. You know, uh, it, and, and the pride of life is all about self-elevation. And all those things, those three things in the world don't. And, and let me tell you something. I love the, I, I, I'm not going to say I love this suit. You may love my new suit, but I don't love it. I enjoy it. I enjoy having it. It's nice to have it. He says we're not to love the world. Because when we begin to let the love for, because when you let it creep in, it robs us of our love for God. But I want to show you something in verse 17. It doesn't end there. He says, and the world is passing away. Can I tell you something? As we begin to crucify the flesh, that means starve the flesh of what it wants and chase after God, all of a sudden the pull of the world, that, what is that? That's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. All of a sudden that begins to pass away. And you can actually get to a place where you are not driven by your own desires, but your desire is to love God and love others. Amen? He says, and the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. See, we can do this. 
You can live within the will of God. You can live as a person who is walking in the will of God. That's God's plan. And he says the world's passing away. There's, there's things in our life that change continually. I remember years ago, and I'll tell you how things change. Some of you remember this device. But there was a time when I got my beautiful Mustang, 1970 Mustang GT, fastback, 302, running car. And I did everything I could to make it loud. Because in those days, loud was important. They had to hear you coming. Now you just tear your muffler off and you're loud. Then it was, you, put, you, you put mufflers that make it louder. And, you fit, and I had that car, it, was, it got so loud I couldn't hear my radio. So I got me something that everybody had in that time called an 8-track player. Now that's dating me, man. Anyone remember an 8-track player? Yeah, the one thing I did like about an 8-track player, I could put on my almond, well, sorry, almond brothers. Forgive me for having Almond Brothers. But I could put on my, put, stick my Almond Brothers 8-track in and it'd just play and play and just repeat over and over. And then there came a time where I went to a high school football game and I came out to my car and somebody had stolen my 8-track player, ripped the speakers right out of my, out of my Mustang. And the, the only consolation was by then the cassettes were coming out. And so we, hey, things pass. Can I tell you that the things that torment you or try to rob you of your love or try to interfere with your relationship with God, if you'll keep chasing Him, you'll find out the closer you get to Him, the less power they have. And all of a sudden, there are things in your life that used to possess you. They don't possess you anymore. And in fact, you don't even want it. You know, why? Because as you deprive yourself, and as you leave it alone, you'll find out that all of a sudden you don't need it anyway. It passes away while you're busy chasing the will of God. Now, since we're talking about love for a minute, let's, let me make sure you understand how important love is. Let's go to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's that, you know, in the Bible, there are certain books of the Bible that are called theme books. Um, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians is called the love chapter. The 11th chapter of Hebrews is called the faith chapter. Psalms 119 is called the word chapter. It's all about the word. Well, here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, and he says something in verse number, uh, verse number 1. Listen to what he says. Talk, and because these first three verses tell us how important love is. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. He's saying now, so if I have all this eloquence, I can speak in English, I can speak in my heavenly language, but if I don't have love, I'm just a bunch of noise, he's saying. Because what happens? When God's people have no love, we're, we have no voice. We have no influence. We, I was talking, you know, I, I was telling you about Ron Garcia a moment ago and as we were taking the offering. He shared with me how that about three years ago, he had a massive stroke. And he said, I felt better, but I could not speak. That stroke robbed me of my voice. And what he said was, he says, I'd try to say, uh, honey, I love you. And I'd say, uh, blah, blah, blah. and I would, he says, and I, in my mind, I knew what I wanted to say, but that stroke had damaged the speech part of my brain. And he said, but he just kept on believing God, and now he's, he speaks great. He preaches. He travels and preaches. And, but God healed him. But see, the church or the Christian that doesn't have the love of God toward people, might as, you, you say, well, I'm preaching, but they hear, blah, blah. It, it's, it's a waste of words because the love is that connector, the connection that causes us to connect with people. And people know whether you love them or not. You can't disguise it. You can't fake it. But he also says in verse 2, so you know you have no influence. If there's no love, the church has no influence. A Christian has no influence in people's lives. But look at verse 2. 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Now the first one he says, you don't have love and it's just a big noise and the church has no voice. But then he's saying here, look at this. Gift of prophecy, prophesying, understanding mysteries and have the word of knowledge and have faith in you moving mountains, but people don't even see you. He says we're nothing. We lose our identity, see. When the church has no love, we actually become invisible. Have you ever thought, wow, we're having the greatest services. People are getting healed. There's manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but no one seems to want to come to our church. Why? We're invisible. Love takes the cloak off the church, and the world can see we're here. Let me tell you something, church. We're not going to be in this building with a motto that says loving God and loving others and then not live in it. As, as a leadership team, we're going to be continually looking for ways we can express the love of God in tangible ways. Remember, it's not much love to say to the person who has no coat in the middle of winter and say, be warm, God bless you, and they're sitting there shaking and shivering. Love says, I've got two coats. I'll give you one of mine. See? That's, we, and as we begin to love more, we'll be seen better. See, a lot of times the reason people don't see the church the way it should be seen is we haven't loved enough. Because in a minute I'll talk about love and what it is, but he says if you don't have love, you're nothing. But look at what he says in verse 3. This is, gets even wilder. And though I bestow all my goods, I gave everything away. What did I do? To feed the poor? And here, it's wilder. And though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. No matter how much we invest into ministry and how much money we spend or how much we give up if we don't have love. And let me tell you something about love. It don't cost much to love. Churches say, well, we don't have a big budget. Then have big love. It don't cost anything to love people. Just effort. And, and, and in the next couple of verses... He, 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 if you stay in that chapter, he says something in verse number uh, four. I think that, let me get my Bible, make sure I'm in the right spot here. Because I'll make sure you say this exactly right. 1 Corinthians 13. Because he talks about what love is. Yes, verse four. Uh, see verse 4 he says two things about you know he talks about what what is love love is two things love is patient and love is kind uh that's all love it you say well what is love it's patient and it's kind that's what love is and when i think of my god who the bible says god is love who is more patient than our god is anyone ever tried God's patience in this house oh a couple of us and then a bunch of liars <laughs> we all have we've tried it because here's the thing I have made up my mind that I'm going to pray this much time or I'm going to do what oh last week I said I'll be, I'll be transparent one more week and then Carl will stop being transparent no I'll always be transparent one of the things God spoke to me I mean strong he see told me to to reduce sugar from my life you know sugar you know sweet stuff and uh somehow i keep saying to god okay i know it's not good for me anyway god once said to me he spoke to my i heard him say to my spirit it's poison and you need to leave it alone and I tell you, isn't it amazing the packages they wrap poison in? That poison, to, to me, it's, you, you help yourself. We gave you, you say, and here you gave us chocolates, Pastor. Well, that's my word. It's not your word, it's my word. God spoke to me. 
And, and I've heard people say things like, well, you, you, you can't help but you got to eat. You got to eat, but you don't have to eat the wrong stuff. That's like somebody saying, I know God doesn't want me to, to smoke, but I've got to breathe. Well, smoking is not breathing. It's breathing in smoke. It's not breathing air. And understand, God has given us all good things to enjoy, and there's plenty of good, healthy things. They just don't taste good. But there are plenty of good, healthy things. Isn't it amazing? There used to be a Christian song that says, Why does the devil have all the good music? And, and, and I want to write one, Why is all the good food fattening? <laughs> <You know. laughs> but here's the deal. God has been patient with me. He didn't say, You didn't do what I said. You're out of the kingdom. And all of us have had God lead us and give us direction, and then we don't go the way He told us to go, and God just keeps on forgiving us over and over again. He is patient. Love is patient. It endures long. I like these, some translations said it endures long, or it's slow to lose patience. I like this one. Love is large and incredibly patient. That's the, the very nature of love. And if you find yourself battling patience, then you need a little more love. You say, well, back up, pastor. No. Here's what I found out as a, as a minister and as a pastor. It is easier for me to be patient with people I love than people I just kind of love. Paul wrote Timothy over in, uh, I think it was 1 Timothy. Yeah. And just trust me, it's not on the screen, but it's important. He tells Timothy about dealing with people. He says, I want you to deal with the older ladies like they were your mom. Just like you, would, you, you just kind of, you know, because I tell you what, you got some sweet little ladies here, but I've had some little ladies that, you know, I wonder if they rode in on a broomstick, you know, a few times through the years. Oh, I, did I say that? Uh, Carla, you'll have to delete that from the video. Uh, had to go on the cutting room floor. But what I meant was, you know, there are some sweet little ladies, and there's some women that spend a whole long time getting mean. And they have to be dealt with. And, he, and, and so apparently Timothy was having some issues, and Paul said to him, you deal with those women like you're dealing with your mom. Because I, I, my mama's still alive. Miss Sue Arp, I love that little lady. But sometimes mom... Can be, uh, Carla calls it nibby. She li she's interested in our events of our life. That's all it is. She just wants to know what's going on. But mom, mom and my mom can be a little bit, uh, she, you know, in, in, in East Tennessee, they, they like to talk about things. And, and she can, you know, they like to take things and just elaborate. And, and my mama can just tell stories, and, and I, but I put up with her. And I say, now, Mom, you know, now the Bible says if you've got a problem with somebody, you don't talk about them, you go to them personally. And, 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 I, and I handle mom real good because she's my mama. But see, Paul is saying to Timothy, put the face of your mother on every little old lady and be patient with them and love them. Can I tell you, that's how we do. And he says, you got a young lady? Put, just look at her like that's your little sister. What's he saying? You love everybody because love is patient. God is patient. And as Christians, if we're going to have love, it comes with patience. Second thing he says about love is it's kind. Love is kind. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I never preach a sermon that I don't brag on Carl at least once. Uh, that's just the way I'm built. And one of the things that my wife possesses is kindness. When you get to know Carla, you'll know that Carla is a kind-hearted person. Now, Kitty's got claws sometimes, but... Uh, I'm sorry, honey. You're kind and sweet and beautiful and awesome and the best mother that I've ever been married to. Hallelujah. No, you're just a great woman. But see, kindness is what love's about. And when somebody gets rough, love's not rough. Love is kind. That doesn't mean you have to be a baby or a wimp. But what it means is there's a kindness behind it. He goes on in verse, uh, the next th three verses he talks about it's not jealous and he has some negative things. But let's skip down to verse 7. Because listen to what he goes on to say. He calls, talks about the power of love and how it works. He says, love never gives up. Never loses faith. 
is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Wow. So what's that mean? Love Never gives up. It's tireless. It just keeps going. Love never loses faith. It keeps believing and keeps believing. It's always hopeful, so it keeps hope no matter what. It endures through anything. It's, I, 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 I consider love as indestructible. You will never do anything in your life that will cause God to not love you. He will love you. He'll love you. And he'll love you, and he'll love you some more. His love is indestructible. And a lot of people have tried to just kind of tempt God, but He is a loving God. And so, that's what He says about love. And He says to Timothy, I want you to be an example. Now, how do we live this? How do we live this thing? I've been talking all this, and I'm going to take just a few more minutes and continue for just a couple more minutes here. Maybe more than a couple. But how do we live this thing? And how do we love the way the Bible teaches us to love? Because as a pastor, I struggled for years with being a, a loving and, and, and releasing love. Because I tell you what, here's the thing, it's Mother's Day. Mothers love their kids. But you know what the dad's job is? To teach kids how to love. And my dad had never received love in his life. My dad's story was a rough one. He grew up the, the, the son of a sharecropper who was an alcoholic, abusive. And, you know, he lived in houses that he said, I'd wake up and snow on my quilt because they'd come through the cracks. He lived in shacks that had dirt for a floor. And uh, as soon as they'd get ahead, his dad's alcoholism would take them backwards. And so he didn't know how to get love. Because he never got it before. He never got it. He told me. He says, I don't remember one time my mom kissing me on the cheek in my whole life. Didn't, they didn't know how in that family. The Arps were a rough bunch. And I was... And, and so my dad could express one emotion. Now, he's in heaven right now, and he's saved in heaven. But, but, but when I was a boy, the one emotion my dad had was anger. He could show you that he was mad. And my life was dedicated to not making him mad. If I tell him something, the first statement is, now, Dad, don't get mad. And then I tell him what happened. And here I am trying to pastor people and love people with all my heart. And I not had really... Now, my mom spoiled me rotten. But with mothers, they just pour it on you. But dads, ex they live the example for boys. And here I am wrestling with that. And God gave me a revelation. He said, it's simple. Fill yourself up with me. And let me love through you. That's it. Fill yourself up with me. And let me love through you. If you, you say, that sounds almost too simple. But it's not. I, you know, I have a little thing. It's, it's, it's a, a little box by Bose. And on its own, it won't play any music. But if I hook it up by Bluetooth to my Spotify account, it amazes me what can come out of that little box. Beautiful worship music. I even got some bluegrass on my Spotify. Bluegrass can come out of that box. All kinds of music can come out of that box. But if it's not connected to the Bluetooth connection, you might, it's just a paperweight. It's the connection that counts. Now, how do I love and how do you love and how's this church love? We get hooked into God. And we let Him fill us up with Himself. Now, that is so simple. You just get in His presence and say, Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up, Lord. And watch Him, like a water bottle under a faucet, 
He just begins to fill you up and you, what you find out is as He gets more, more places in you and as He takes His spot in you and before you know it, you find out that he, you're past the halfway mark. You know, when, he's, when it's just about a fourth, there's still three-fourths you and one-fourth God. And then all of a sudden you got it to that place where it's half of you and half of God. And before you know it, you keep inviting him in and inviting him in. And then all of a sudden, there's more of him than there is of you. And the whole goal is to get so filled up with him. And you say, I don't want to lose my... God is not going to rob you of your identity. He's going to perfect your identity. Amen. Understand, when you give place to God, he makes you a better you. He makes you the you of heaven. And He begins to live through you and do through you what you were born to do because He enables you to do it. And then as you surrender and He gets more and more control over our lives, we catch ourselves just naturally loving people because of instead of mad at someone for their wickedness, we weep for them because of their blindness. Understand something. We are living in a generation where people haven't been taught anything. This is a post-Christian nation. Uh, we met as a, a, a group of bishops this last week with our denomination, and we came to the and we admitted and, and accepted that we are the largest mission, third largest mission field on, in the in the world is United States now. People are coming from other countries to be missionaries here. Our nation has slipped. But does that call us as a church to rise up as an angry church and say, to hell, go to hell, we don't care. We're, we're going to follow God and you're lost and we don't care. No. Our heart is, help us Christ to love them the way you love them. See, love is best described as a hill called Mount Calvary, where Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to a cross and suspended between heaven and earth. And, and the physical pain is almost unbelievable. But if you think about the righteousness of Christ, holy and perfect, and allowing himself to become sin, and to take sin upon his body and hang there between heaven and earth, being the supreme sacrifice, that's love. I think the greatest few words of love ever spoken by Christ was when he looked down from the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In their mind, they knew what they were doing, but they didn't have a clue. But I want to tell you something. God loves you deliberately. There's a word that I want us to, to live by here at our church. It's called intentionally. We want to be intentional about what we do. We are going to love with intent. We intend to love people. We're going to care intentionally. We're going to do everything we do intentionally. It's not by chance. It's not as a reaction. We get up. And remember, I, I challenged my a class on Wednesday night. Wake up tomorrow and ask God, what would you have me do today? That's going to be our thing, God. How would you have us love today? How can I show somebody love today? Oh, I feel this love right here, right now. It's by His Holy Spirit. Whew. Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping me express your word this morning. And I pray, God, I did it justice. Please, Lord, I pray that I did, the be I did my best, Father. But I ask right now that you begin to move through this room and just saturate this room with your love. Do it, Father. Whew. There's something happening in this room, folks. I can feel it.